Hey everybody, this is Alan Danziger and I play Jerry, the wisecracking van driver in the original and cult classic Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And guys, you're listening to terrific show, Movie Rain. It's time for the Movie Rain. Tonight's victim is former actor Alan Danziger that has played in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Hello. Hello, how you doing? Fantastic, man. So what have we been doing lately in this dark time? And you've been doing a lot of cons or... Well, I'm due to do, uh, to do one here in uh, in Texas at in Bastrop in February if, if things hold up but, but with the you know with the pandemic and stuff that's going on I'm not sure we'll just have to play it by ear because unfortunately at this age I'm in that sweet spot so I can't afford to get sick it could be sayonara for me. Was there any other projects in between that you've been working on or have you ever thought about actually uh, doing something of your own the Texas Chainsaw Massacre by any chance or like even you're like maybe something on the web or anything like you like episodes or anything that yeah, you'd like to do? Yeah, I have my own website, which is com, and there's a lot of fun things on that website, articles and, and reviews of the movie that featured me, and also have a line of uh, t-shirts that I sell and, and photos that people can order, and now we're working with a company out of China, a talking bobblehead of my character, so I'm real excited about that, and then just about a week or so ago, interview a Zoom meeting with the remaining cast from the movie and then the next day they shot the crew that shot the movie and it's going to be like a two-day event coming up in the next month or so i'm real excited about that and it was great you know getting in touch with the remaining cast members some that i haven't seen in ages you know when it comes to the the performances and everything do you think that when a character is in a situation do you think that the effect part of it is is more about that than in the situation than the anticipation first do you think the situation is really the the more key of, of the element of surprise so to speak you know i don't know if it's the egg before the chicken the chicken before the egg but for me what really worked you know or just getting ready for my death scene i had not seen leatherface you know in costume until i actually walk into the house and then to the kitchen and the way we handled that was i sat on the porch i had them blindfold me which is I kidding say that's my nod to the Stanislavski method. So I got myself into a tizzy. And so when they said, ready to go, action, I went in, went into the kitchen. I see the hook freezer and the noises and whatnot. I opened up. He comes, I go, hey. And I start screaming. And this was before even Gunner was in the frame. Toby had to call cut and come over to me and put his arm around me and said, Alan, it's a great scream, but you got to wait till he's in the frame, you know, with the sledgehammer. So we had to do that actually a few times. But each time I was able to come out with the right scream and to make it work a couple of the grips were behind me and had their fingers in my uh belt loophole so when he comes down with the hammer it's offset by them grabbing me and, and taking me down so over 45 years ago and i'm still getting terrible headaches and you know normally like the anticipation is like usually the first thing half the time because the build-up of course build-up is great you know that fear effect what's in the darkness and stuff and and the character's not knowing but in this case for the Texas chainsaw massacre there's something there that is there but it doesn't come out until like a little bit later it's not like there's something creeping behind like the camera's creeping around or the character you can, you can tell when something is about to happen f- to the viewer, but as far as character goes, but when you have the, the, the actual situation, it's like whatever happens, whatever goes, because you never know. And once it starts with Kirk, Bill Vale going into the house, and he gets done in, and that door closes, that sound, it just becomes, it's relentless after that. It's just absolutely relentless. It just doesn't quit. Considering the, of the time period and the elements and everything like that, the motivation, how was the motivation to you as an actor and as well as the people you worked with, how was the motivation between the elements, the locations, everything at once was always a, a mixture between a different mentality of how to perform uh, despite of how brutal it was? For me, a lot of it was really me being myself. I mean, I was just, that was naturally me. I'm, I get around, I have a, a good time, I joke around. So then being put into that situation, the heat, the fact that this is Texas and picking up the hitchhiker, it was just a crazy time. It just worked out. All the scenes that we did, I had a blast. My best scene, I think, that I had the most fun with is the one where we pull into the gas station. We stop to get gas and then Jim Seedow, he comes out, he says, we got no gas and you know, we're looking at in disbelief. And while that's going on, this foal, actually he was a, a fellow that was a friend of uh, Marilyn Burns, and he comes over to, to the van and starts washing all this dirty, soapy water on the windshield. Now, during one of the takes, I inadvertently hit the windshield wiper, and it just filled with slosh, all this dirty water on uh, Jim Seedow, and he's trying to deliver his lines, and all this soapy water is just streaming down his face. And it was the 
much for me and Bill. We just broke up, and we never were able to get it together. It took all day to shoot that scene, and it ended up with Toby getting so upset that he walked off the set, and Hankel had to finish it up. That's one of my favorite scenes, actually. Do you think a, a character's innocence uh, more of an accurate choice than it is an actual appeal bait for the actual audience? Yeah, I think it was just we were the naive pay. I mean, a lot of things were written. As the movie progressed, they had to change things and, and change scenes. So it was like, this is happening as we're shooting the movie. Things were changed, lines that didn't work. A lot of things that I had lived, they kept, you know, in the movie. Some of those are my own lines. Like, he knows where you live. I even gave him your zip code. Or, hey, you guys quit goofing on me. Those are my own lines. Crazy you humor in the movie and I think when they started to change it to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that was a brilliant move the editing a lot of things that happened after the movie was shot I think started to play up the horror aspect and less of the funny stuff although I mean there's quite a bit of funny stuff in there you're watching with that kind of tone for this movie and it clearly definitely for many many people like it's a lot of horror. Would you think this is a great mixture that was used for, or at least a good example as a good mixture for these two, for, that could have been used for many films? Do you think this is a good example, or do you think this is like a one-of-a-kind, kind of a unique way of how to blend these two in a straight, very dark film? I didn't know if those kids were told to realize what was going to happen, how this movie was going to take off. It was just something that they did, and it just happened that everything worked. The graininess of the film, the the low budget, the heat, the costumes that we ended up, you know, wearing that were our own stuff. One reviewer referred to me as this 30-something disco dude that cracked me up. I mean, just a lot of funny reviews of the movie, and yet the guy that I think really kicked it off was Rex Reed. He, he said it was the scariest movie he's ever seen. And when it comes to the story itself, there's not a, a tremendous amount of explanation, and I mean this in a positive way, meaning that you don't really know where these kids are going. They, they could be going uh, for, the, for their actual destination. You know that where they stop at, but you don't know exactly where they're going. And this is a very long stretch of road in Texas. But as far as the, the story goes, like, how did you really prepare for, for that particular moment? I mean, was there actual real backstory to this? Or did you have to figure out your own backstory and, and just let it run with whatever it is that Toby was directing toward you? I think that's it. I don't think that there was a lot of, I knew about backstory. I wasn't even sure about the deal when, in the van where they're talking about the planets and retrograde. I didn't know it about astrology and you no know, Leo from anything. It was like learning as you go. So it was a learning experience all the way around. It just happened. That's what I can say. It just happened. This is a very different way of filmmaking too at that time. And this is a different time period. Like, Was this something a little bit different for you? Like how to react and possibly underreact in certain circumstances? Like especially you're in a van cramped with a bunch of people and here's a, a scene being filmed and having like these very tight angles. Was this more of a challenge you to work with that specifically rather other than the performance itself? I guess I just went with it. I mean, my acting experience was virtually nil. I mean, I had been in the, a movie, I don't know if you've seen this, was Toby's, I think, first feature. It's a movie called Eggshells, and that was like more of a cinema verite type of movie, where this is the scene, and at the time, it was with my wife at the time, and my son was like eight months old, and I was doing social work, and it was about a young couple that were living into like a haunted type of uh, house, and it was kind of like a hippy-dippy type of movie. And so they came to my house, they shot some scenes, and then they started adding more scenes for me to be in it. And because of that movie, Ed Show, that's how I got into Chainsaw, because they came to me with the script and said, Alan would like you to play this character. So I didn't even have to audition for it. You know, so it was just being myself, so the angles, the camera, you know, I wasn't even aware of it. It just was, this is the scene, just do it, and... That's what we did. That's what I did. And when it comes to working with Toby Hooper himself, like, did you have to establish a relationship or did you understand that relationship in terms of his directorial or didn't have to actually op be open about your possible differences of character? Was it a different kind of outlook for you working with a different director as opposed to Eggshells or any other film that you ever worked with? Well, Eggshells was, I mean, it was Toby was, it was the same character and Toby really did give a lot of direction. He, only a couple of times do I really remember when he took me aside and said a couple of things. But for the most part, we were just fodder to just fill the movie until we get killed. We were just there, actually, you know, to get killed. So, I mean, there wasn't a lot of deep thinking about the character or whatnot. We were just waiting on her, waiting our turn to be done in by Leatherface. These emotions, do you think the, the characters in this particular film gives that emotion rather than the, the tone of the camera itself giving emotion this time? Because a lot of horror films are morally, morally doing that. Like, the camera is giving you the emotion rather than the, the actual character first. The fact is that it just happened the way it happened, and, and I think for some reason it just seems to 
be believable. All of us in like this could happen to these people in Texas. And as a result, actually, I never picked up another hitchhiker after that movie was done. It, it can be a subtle influence for anybody. Like, don't pick up hitchhikers. Same thing with Jaws. Don't go in the ocean. <laughs> but these are prime fears in a way. But being a part of this type of fear factor, would you say this is almost like a one-on-one type of fear to really experiment and actually pass on? Or do you think that's it's so unique that it, it really needs to have a, a decent mixture in order to really play off the scenes? I think you need a mixture, and I think that this movie seems to have some of that. There's a little bit of the fun stuff in there to just help break the tension. Because I would read reviews where people got sick, threw up, you know, ran out of the movie screaming. I mean, it terrorized people. For years, it was banned in Europe. Couldn't even see it. Odd thing about the horror, because it reaches out to people in different ways that they never even possibly exist. I mean, it's just something that, in a way, kind of prepares you in life after just seeing this. Here's a guy with a, with a mask that you don't know if it's a mask or what, what he is, but you realize that's a human face. <laughs> you know, the thing is, and you know, it's deeply sad that, I mean, Marilyn is gone, Sally's gone, and Gunner is gone. And while we were making the movie, I didn't know Gunner, never spoke until after the movie. And after the movie, we became really good friends. In fact, stayed with me the summer before he left for Maine. And he was just a beautiful person, very bright, very gentle. And we had a great time. We became really good friends. And I was deeply sad that his passing a few years ago. What would you actually want to change differently with your character? I would have liked to have had more of a relationship with Sally. There's no hugging. There was no affection. And I think that somewhat was missing. And besides being she was beautiful, I wish they had a couple of scenes like that. Now, it's all there. Every, there's a lot of hugging and kissing and fondling in the, the new Chainsaw movies. But back then, that was, I guess, a no-no. I would have liked to have seen more of a interaction or a fun interaction. Actually, the only real interaction is one that's not so pleasant. That's at the end, as I'm getting ready to go toward the house, she wanted to go with me, and I said, no, you stay here. And then her response is, she's, like, she's pretty upset about it. How would you play that off? Like, let's say you got stuck in the house of your character. I mean, let's say you got kept up in a room somewhere. I mean, how would you actually play that off if you had that control? Would you, would you actually do that kind of fear, or would you stick with this? So it's a little less unsaid. I mean, he takes a shot to the head, but you don't know for sure. I mean, did he die? What happened? So it's a little bit ambiguous. So maybe it's a concussion, and he comes to, and maybe he has to figure out how do I get out of this situation, you know, and warn my friends or whatnot. So maybe there would be something to be discovered about that. But the way it's it played is like, boom, he gets the shot to the head, he's gone, and that's the end of it. There's no follow-through. It's a different tone of film where you, the beginning of starting to like a character, and then bam, it's gone. That's the crazy part about it. All these characters that's in this movie, well, except for Franklin, Franklin's the most annoying. <laughs> <laughs> what a great actor he was because we all hated him. Nobody wanted anything to do with him. Back. And after the movie was over and we got together at a couple of conventions, the horror thing, he was the nicest guy. I loved the guy. Really also smart, really sweet, and just a terrific guy. So that shows really what a, a talented fellow he was. Yeah, and if your co-workers are actually hating you, you're doing a, a really good job, not just for the audience and not just for yourself, but you're doing it for everybody else. But Like he said, he said he didn't know how to take the character off, take it off. So he just stayed with the character through the whole movie. Whereas the rest of us, we were okay. This is the scene, and you're back to being yourself. That was all. He was just obnoxious straight through. Now, was it always a, a, a separate type of casting between you and everybody else? Or was it actually a, a bandit type between Toby and you guys when it comes to acting these parts out? Was there really a, some experimenting with that too, as well, like you playing as Kirk, or like give an idea of like switching roles in a way? Or was was he really straightforward with this? That never happened. This was my character. You do this, Bill did this, and it's like a six-week shoot, and they were changing things all the time, so there just wasn't a lot of going back and forth, you play this character, you do this, it just, that, that wasn't going on back then. Even though there's sequels and remakes and reboots, is this a film that, if you were to tell a different story with this character, involving this character, do you think this should have been approached more delicately and so it can be told in, in a different way? Or w would you say Satisfactory is almost high demand for this, especially of, of how well it was received? What's happened over the years speaks for itself, whether it was by luck or by whatever dint of their imagination, that they came up with a script and the whole shooting process that just worked incredibly well for something that was shot like in 1973. I think originally they had like a $40,000 budget. You see the movie really, I mean actually very little gore in the movie. It's the hint of it. It's your imagination. The scene with Harry on the hook, people think that it's impaling her. Just the way they shot it. It's incredible. They're really talented guys and, and somebody that doesn't get enough mention at least to me is Robert Burns. He was the, the crop 
guy, and he made all of the props, and he was a genius, and he gave the movie that kind of look that it's just universal now. As these sequels and, and everything that's like do continue, or at least are slowly coming back in a way, would you say something iconic like this, or has become iconic like this, would you say the more that they keep making, the less valuable that this character or the, or the actual premise of the story can become? Well, I seen so. I mean, there's been just so many, the beginning, the prequel, the sequel, the chainsaw, the team, the, the beginning with Dennis Hopper, Matthew McConaughey, and R- Renee Zellweger. I mean, some of those are just so over the top that they're almost comedy. The character Leatherface becomes less and less approachable or, or, or basically straightforward. It's basically, here's a dog and let's watch him run. That's what that's the vibe I get from all these other sequels. I don't see, in my personal opinion, I don't see anything new about this character because, okay, he's got a child like mine. He's been basically trained by his own family to be this crazed uh, maniac and he doesn't know what is really right and wrong. But at the same time, I like to see him change it up, change up his moral values. Like, should he kill a victim? Should he not kill a victim? I, I like to see him actually stop and wonder about something like this. Well, you see him at, at the window after he's come in and he's hit me and then he puts her back into the uh, freezer and he goes over to the window and he's like hitting his head like, what have I done? You know, what's going on? I mean, he's bewildered. He's bewildered. Oh, absolutely. And I, I get that vibe on that scene what, of his character when it almost seems like Grandpa Sawyer, these guys just came up in the house. What am I going to do with these bodies? He's going to get mad at me and so forth. And so forth. I mean, I get that vibe too. Like, he's afraid of whatever he does, like, going to get punished for something like this. Didn't see that. Just look what he did to the door. Pretty funny. He didn't know what to do. Even though he did, Leatherface did something right, the Grandpa Sawyer had to go find something that he didn't do right and still had to be right no matter what. <laughs> And but, then the scene at the end, you know, with, with Marilyn, where she runs into his place, and then he, he kind of beats her off, puts her in the pickup, and then he closes, and he's getting ready to leave, and then he goes back in, into the door to make sure the lights are out, because he said the high cost of utilities is enough to drive a man out of business. Those are some funny stuff. Despite of how critical it claimed, do you think this is something that really should be held in high example of what horror is and what it represents as far as character and as far as storytelling? No question. I mean, this movie's like, what, in the museum? of modern art or someplace as more and more of these sequels come out people compare that to the original and it, it's great that they like the original the best yeah and it's not the lack of creativity it's not enforcing more creativity that's, that's why i think in the issue on these if you're going to make these franchises and and try to keep this character from being a dead horse so to speak you got to enforce more creativity you got to be open to more creativity yeah it's going to cost you a lot more money but then hey that's your end trying to figure out on the marketing aspect and trying to get more money out of that but in order to make it more interesting and and, and keep leatherface in that rank because as time goes, as these sequels go, he's going to be in the background because Freddy and Jason and, and Michael Myers, these guys are going to be right up front and he's going to be in the back. Well, hopefully not. Hopefully Leatherface will be in the pantheon and the top tier of, of uh, characters. And at the same time, there's just something sympathetic about him too. At least in the first one, there's a childlike quality to him. It's unbelievable that after all these years that people still appreciate the movie, appreciate what I brought to it, and have been most gracious to have a chance to go to these conventions, and I meet the fans. It's incredible. I love it. Go and plug in any websites or anything that we can check out right now. Go to my uh, website, ChainsawJerry.com. There's a lot of clips and movie reviews that are on there, and I have like a bunch of articles that I collected over the years, like an archival type of, and I've had them digitized, and we're going to start putting them on my website in the next couple of weeks. But on my website, there are clips and movie reviews that are, are a lot of fun and people can see it and, and have a good time. And then hopefully the Zoom interview that I did with the rest of the cast, that should be coming together in the next month or so. And there you have it, everybody. That is former actor Alan Danziger. Thanks so much. and a pleasure. I had a good time talking to you.